And you are live, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Northboro Board of Selectmen meeting of November 21st, 2007. I'm Mitch Cohen. I chair this, uh, this merry little group. I have some introductory announcements. <clears throat> this open meeting of the Northboro Board of Selectmen is being conducted remotely, consistent with the July 16th, 2022 Act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. All members of the Northboro Board of Selectmen are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows Northboro Board of Selectmen to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to Northboro Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link posted on the agenda. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting, as all of our meetings, will feature public comment. I'd like to go around the room and uh, make sure that members of the board can be heard and hear us. Uh, Scott Rogers? Present. Kristen Wickstead? Here. Julianne Hirsch? Here. Jason Perot? Here. We also have with us uh, Fire Chief, just by, by my screen here, Fire Chief Dave Parenti. Present. Town Administrator John Kader. Present. Assistant Town Administrator Becca Meekins. Present. DPW Director Scott Charpentier. Present. Police Chief Bill Liver. Present. And Finance Director Jason Little. Present. We also have Northboro Cable uh, with us to, uh, to, to aid in recording and broadcasting our meeting. Um, no further remarks. Let's get started. Uh, first item on our agenda are some, actually, before we even get to the meeting minutes, public comment, as always. Um, if there are any members of the audience that would like to speak to anything, particular anything that's not on our agenda, this would be a good time to raise your hands. We already have a hand up. I have four Maselli is how you're listed in... The participants, I'm going to allow you to talk now. Oh. Hi, if you could identify yourself, please. Hi there, this is Lisa Maselli, 13 Maple Street. Hi, Lisa, what's on your oh. mind? Um, well, I haven't called in in a while and I thought I would do it tonight. Um, I have a couple of questions um, and it is, you know, that's something that's not on the agenda. Um, I wanted to know first if the appropriations committee is yet for, for year ending 2023 to go over the budget. Um, if so, when and where can the minutes to that meeting be found? And then I have a follow up to that. I, I don't think appropriations has, have met yet. Is that correct, John? No, they're, they have not started their, uh, their cycle just yet. Great, thank you. Your other question? Yeah, so in, in light of that, um, I wanted to highlight a November 11th letter to the editor regarding ARPA money. Uh, the author stated that these funds should be used for capital assets and projects already identified, citing the example of purchasing a new fire engine, saving the taxpayer 800,000 plus interest of if ARPA money is used. He further stated that Perot Rogers and the administrator understood how to properly use the resources in the best interest of the town. Further citing the other members of the BOS hadn't considered the impact that the pandemic had on you and your family. It was signed by Tim Kalin as a member of the Northboro Appropriations and as a former selectman and as a former chair of diversity and a member of the Council of Aging, not as a resident. So the reader would assume that the meeting of the appropriations would have occurred and a vote would have been made to, to legally have Kalen represent the committee. Um, when a resident fails to disclose their speaking as such, and the titles following his name give greater weight to his misguided opinion, it is questionable behavior and at best, at best and may be illegal at worst. Um, I was the recipient of a uh, situation uh, when I made a remark on Facebook and uh, the town council was brought forward and I was asked to uh, leave my post uh, on design review, but I did nothing wrong. Um, perhaps there should be um, equal um, 
equal res representation. And um, I think that perhaps Mr. Kalin, who's misrepresented himself by speaking for the committee, should be removed from the committee. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Um, <clears throat> the Board of Selectmen has no oversight over the Appropriations Committee. Um, I would suggest if you wanted to bring that either to the Appropriations Committee or uh, to the town moderator who um, is the appointing authority to that board. Okay. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, anyone else in the audience wish to uh, speak in our public session before we get into the meat of the agenda? Okay, um, next up is uh, the meeting minutes of the November 7th, 2022 meeting minutes. Is there a motion or anything else to add on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the November 7th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Second. Okay, motion made by Julianne, seconded by Scott. Any discussion? I have discussion. Julianne, go for it. Um, so, I, I would like a couple of sentences to be added. One in the section about Aspen Aerogel, it says that there was there were no comments from the board. And I, I did ask a question about what happens with the license if the, if the company is sold or changes hands. And um, the, the answer from John Cordaire was that the license stays with the property. So I think it's important to add that as well as under the topic of the fire station committee. Um, there, I did also ask the question of how many applicant applications were received. There were, um, and I'm, you know, kind of paraphrasing from the from the video, 12 to 14 applications, but um, John thought that that most of them were from were affiliated with firemen or, or f firefighters or their families. So um, I think it's important that those statements be included. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Um, uh, I'll get uh, recognize you just a second, Jason. In general, I. Add, particularly adding language to a set of meeting minutes is hard to do verbally. Um, if the board is okay with it, I have no problem holding on to the set of meeting minutes. You can correspond with Diane in the office before our next meeting to suggest those additions, um, which I, I mean, off the top of my head, I think they make sense to add. They were pertinent to the discussions that you mentioned. Um, but I'd rather not try to insert, you know, more than a word or two into a set of meeting minutes currently under discussion. My own, my own take. I open to any other opinions. Uh, Jason, you had your hand up before. Uh, same sentiment. If there isn't any draft text being submitted, then either not make the amendment or hold over the minutes uh, until the amendment, uh, the draft text is present for everyone to review. Yeah. And because this was just our most recent meeting, there's no um, legal urgency to approve them at this meeting. So I think uh, for my take, that's fine. Anyone have any objection? In which case, Julianne? So would you like me to move that we uh, postpone the approval of the minutes? Sure. So moved. <laughs> okay. And my, my assumption is you are then withdrawing the motion that you made earlier yes. to approve the meeting minutes. Just. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify that, and would someone else like to second Julianne's motion about postponing action on these meeting minutes? Second. Okay, motion made by Julianne, seconded by Kristen. Any discussion on that one? Okay, all those in favor, let's see. Jason? Aye. Julianne? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Scott? Aye. I also vote aye. Um, action on the meeting minutes of November 7th, 2022 are postponed until the next meeting. Uh, next up on our agenda, we have a presentation on Toys for Tots. Yes, and as I mentioned earlier, how busy they are, and yeah. just as they're ready to come on, Captain Ted gets sent out to a bar fire up on 290. So if you're on 290 heading west, you're going to be stuck in traffic. So if you're listening to this, don't go 290 west. Okay. There's, there's still on okay. our way there. So. Um, would you 
prefer that we maybe delay it? Do you, I don't know no. if that's something that you can speak to or- I, I'd be more than happy to speak to it. I yes, fantastic. I knew, I knew Rob was on duty, so I planned for this. Uh, good for this good contingency planning, please yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. So, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm listening to the call at the same time I am, I'm trying to talk to you, so I apologize. Um, the uh, Toys for Tots that we do annually, Captain Tev always hands that, uh, heads that up. And we've been incredibly successful, and I, I can't give you the numbers, but we've been very successful. since I've been here, at least seven years I've been here. Uh, Captain Tev is uh, really passionate about it. Uh, he's already uh, at the drive through flu clinic, had a box there already. Um, but the, uh, the actual official opening date was November 19th. Uh, the box is, there is a box at uh, the fire station as you come right in that front door. Box sits right there. You can leave your, uh, your donations in there. And uh, Captain Tev then every couple of days bags them up, secures them so they're not out in the open because you know, guys take off in the middle of the day and there's no way down there. They always secure. Uh, they're looking for, obviously, that they need to be uh, new toys. They don't have uh, new toys. And anyone who wants to make a uh, uh, a donation in lieu of purchasing a toy, you can uh, go to toysfortotsusa.org and make the donation uh, through that way. And if you have any questions for Captain Ted, you can reach him either by calling the fire station at 508-393-1537 or emailing <laughs> Captain Ted directly. And that's R-T-H-E-V-E -E at town.northborough.ma.us. Perfect, thank you very, very much. Um, any members of the board have any questions? That's a very important program. I'm very happy we do it annually and I look forward to uh, even more success than we have, all right. There being nothing else, next up on our agenda is the Community Affairs Committee. We have uh, the chair, Susie Sizlika. Um, Susie, I'm going to bring you fully into the meeting. <clears throat> Hi, Susie. How are you? Good. How are you? I have to say... Uh, Zoom for me has, I haven't used it in a, a couple of months and I tuned into the meeting and I'm like, am I a panelist? When is my video going on? What am I doing? Like, it's like, I blocked it all out all those, all that time. But um, I want to say thank you for having us. We're um, very excited to be planning the tree lighting in person again this year. It will be Saturday, December 3rd, if I could get permission to um, close Blake Street. And I, first of all, um, and I don't, and I don't call him this, I call him this to keep it straight with Scott Rogers, but DPW Scott is, the DPW is fantastic. They are my silent partner on almost every, everything that we plan, um, working in the background. There he is. Hi, Scott. Thank you. Um, and he, it's just been wonderful. So we couldn't do anything we do without them. So thank you. Even the concerts, I mean, I have my emergency phone number to call if the gazebo's off, um, calling about extra trash cans, like they're, they're always there for us. So I wanted to say thank you to him. Um, we also have the fifth grade Northborough chorus. It used to be just the Z chorus. And now with the new teachers, they have expanded it to the whole elementary um, fifth grade. And it's, it's fantastic. My son will be singing for the first time this year. So we're very excited. Um, He's actually, I will let you know that they're downstairs and they're waiting. They're like, what if they don't close Blake Street for you? We're supposed to be singing. <laughs> so <laughs> you have a fifth grader very worried about this in the house. But um, I also want to thank um, Northborough has pizza. They donate pizzas for us to hand out um, to the customers that want to have a snack while they're, they're there. Metro West Painting now takes care of the cocoa for us and they love handing it out. So they took that off my plate. Um, Wegmans donates um, the cookies and the paper, um, the napkins and cups. And we also have high school volunteers. We started partnering with the high school to get those high schoolers their volunteer hours. They hand out, hand out candy canes and bells for 
us so people can sing along. Um, and we have the American Legion Honor Guard that comes. Um, and we also, we have a member of the Ellsworth family that sings the, uh, the, the national anthem. So um, I do want to put it out there. A couple of people have asked if we're going to move the tree to um, the common. And Scott and I talked about it very, very early stages. Um, I did reach out. I, when I spoke with the honor guard, that's something that I just want to put out to you guys. Um, if we wanted to look at the common, if we wanted to look at a tree, if we wanted to see where a tree could be planted for future dedication. I did not live here when the current tree became the Ellsworth tree. Um, but I just, I wanted to put it out there because we have had to cut down some trees around the current tree um, and then maybe plan a dedication ceremony for it. So I do want to acknowledge that people have been asking about that. We would love to use the common, but I don't, I don't want to, you know, just kind of rush into it. So putting it out to the board. Um, and I love that I came after Toys for Tots. We've been working with Captain Tev. He's um, a neighbor of mine. And we will also have a bin for Toys for Tots. And we bring them immediately over to the fire station. And we will also be taking donations for the food pantry. So if you're out and about on that Saturday, pick something up and bring it. Um, the last thing... I, I wanted to talk about myself was, you know, we are very sad that we don't have the committee for the trolley anymore. Um, I was part of a small unofficial committee last year to do the snowman hunt. And it was a, a huge undertaking um, and not something that community affairs can take on while planning other events during the year or on our budget. We receive $500 from the town every year. And that doesn't even cover... Um, that covers about half a band, one band for me for the summer. So I just, I would love um, if any businesses out there in Northboro are having an open house. I know not everybody sells something, but if they're going to have a craft, a sidewalk sale, email the community affairs and we'll try to put together a list. I know, you know, it's something that we've thought about, but um, it takes, it takes a lot of man work. And the trolley was originally a business driven event. So the businesses were the ones that kind of ran it. So an economic development committee or a, a chamber of commerce, I'm not sure. That's not up to me. And I'm not trying to make anybody extra work in the town hall. But um, something that would be really cute and it could be easy. Like if you look at Westboro, they just have a list of businesses. But just something I wanted to throw out there as well, because we love to help small businesses. But I also don't want to do something not to the best of our ability. Um, in the menorah this year, perhaps my um, menorah partner, Mitch, might want to take over. Um, it will be at the town common, but it will not be lit, and it will be removed until Hanukkah begins. Is that correct, Mitch? I got it right. Yeah, right. so, um, so uh, last year I, I helped organize the, uh, the town menorah to be placed. It, Hanukkah happened to overlap last year with the tree lighting which made for a great launch year um holidays don't always overlap in the same way because they're very different calendars this year hanukkah is later in the month uh begins the evening of the 18th and ends the afternoon of the 26th um but what we'll do because a lot of people were very excited to have the menorah there and speaking with religious experts far more high up the chain than I am. Um, they thought it was a great idea to have the menorah there with light bulbs, not with candles, if you will, um, the way we do the lighting that would be on the third. Um, so it would be set up that night. We would turn it on simultaneous with the tree and everyone can ooh and ah, and that would be about it. And then the menorah will, uh, will be put back into storage uh, soon thereafter and then come back out uh, for lighting on the evening of the 18th. Uh, Hanukkah is eight nights. And there are a lot of towns around us and communities around us that um, that have a menorah. And I, I will say that our adding a menorah inspired the town of Grafton to add one this year um, to their calendar, which I was very, very excited to hear about. Um, so the lighting that we will have so we don't conflict with others uh, would be the uh, the evening of the 25th happens to be obviously a very popular holiday among many other people uh, and that's great we understand it's not going we're not planning a, a very large event like the tree lighting um, 
we as a town still need to figure out exactly what the menorah lighting is. But, um, but similar to last year, um, we'll have people take turns um, lighting the candles at the top of the menorah on that night. It's a little bit more celebratory it being the eighth night. So all of them get lit. Uh, and the seven prior nights, I anticipate, will just turn on the light bulbs uh, without any fanfare. We may have um, donuts and or hot chocolate, something like that, um, uh, on the 25th for the town lighting. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly what the town needs to do to formally make that happen, but I would uh, appreciate if we could do that, all that good stuff as well. Susie, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add. Um, we will have a we will have a member um, who is supposed to join you on December 25th as well, who does not celebrate Christmas. So she has volunteered to show up. Um, I I don't know if if I could also ask for the closing of Blake or maybe I don't even know if do you, would you want the whole street closed for the menorah I, on Christmas I, or I would probably look for for guidance maybe from. Um, police chief or DPW director as to what they thought. I, I, because this would be our first standalone menorah lighting. I don't know how to predict what the crowds will be. We're not planning for a big chorus. I, I, if I were to guess if we had 25 or 30 people there, that would be a smashing success. So I don't know if that would really warrant closing Blake street. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it up to the public safety officials to make that determination. I would think that, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman, 20, 30 people at the Blake Street area would not warrant a closure of the street. I'm not sure what your thoughts are, Chief. Well, uh, more concerning for the larger crowd at Blake Street for our, from a public safety perspective, I agree. Um, we'll have an officer there regardless, just to make sure there's no traffic or parking issues. That's great. I'm, I'm sure it may get bigger as it continues and as you know, years go by. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine with that. So I will just include my um, my ask for the closure of Blake Street to be for um, the third for the tree lighting then, and then not incorporate um, Christmas evening for the menorah. And we're and we're very excited, and I'm going to be working with Mitch on um, helping with whatever he needs as well. So we're very we're very excited for it. I I did forget when I was thanking everybody to thank my own committee because it, it's they're just wonderful and the creative ideas, at, and even the people that um, aren't officially on the committee anymore that have appeared before here and have worked with us. I mean all everyone still helps in some way. And I can always call and ask a question. And do you remember this? Do you have this? And it's, it's, I really love the committee and the work that we do. So I want to thank my members um, for everything that they do. It's really a, a collaborative effort. Any questions from members of the board, either for Susie or for myself on the menorah or comments? Julianne? Well, first of all, thank you for all, all of your work, but, um, and I'm gonna put this question to John. Um, Susie, you mentioned that you, you get $500 a year from the town budget. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any way we can consider raising that? It, maybe, it, it, because that's been for several years, right? Many years. Maybe it's time to take an, uh, another look at that. I know you're going into budget planning. Is, can we request that that be considered? Um, I can't remember if it's the Cultural Council of Community Affairs that had uh, made a request already. So I don't know sure if a request has been made already, but if you want to send in a request, we'll, we'll take it up as part of the budget process. So like a specific request for more money? I've never, the only time yeah. I've ever asked for um, other funds was when we were being considered for some of the ARPA, the Be Well Northboro funds, um, but we didn't receive anything from it. We just have our standard $500 for each committee. Do you have any guidelines or suggestions? <laughs> I will take, I mean, 
we we have like a we hustle for our donations you know? yeah i mean these um, these smaller committees are you know it's a, it's it's not meant to fund the committee it's meant as seed money to to get you going to cover some some basic right. stuff but the the it's anticipated and expected that you know these would be primarily donor driven but uh to give a little bit of funding so um you know, so uh, whatever it would be, would be, a, you know, I would think something nominal, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board or from staff? Okay, seeing none, there are a couple of suggested motions on this. Do I hear something on Blake Street, closer? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to close Blake Street on Saturday, December 3rd, 2022 from 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. for the tree lighting ceremony. Second. Motion made by Jason, seconded by Scott. Any discussion? All those in favor, Scott. Aye. Julianne. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Jason. Aye. I also vote aye. Vote is unanimous. Blake Street will be closed as per vote. Uh, and is there anything on, actually, I have a more of a question for John. Why do we have to have a vote on placing a menorah on, uh, on the town property? I don't, I don't know that you do. Okay. <laughs> uh, it just came through yeah. as a request, uh, yeah. you know, the prior year. So, uh, so that was, uh, that's how it came forward. In fact, I, I asked Diane the same thing as in terms of, why do, why do we need to do that? But uh, I think part of it is, you know, that we do a lot of things that come before the board that I think technically aren't, isn't necessary, but having the discussion uh, promotes the events, raises awareness. And that's typically why sometimes we'll vote to, to do things that technically you don't need to. It's because it gets on the agenda, on the agenda and, and allows a, a public discussion. Yeah, my, the only reason I asked the question for things like this is it implies that we could say no, which I don't think anyone would ever imply that we could or would. Um, but I have no objection if someone would like to make that motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion. Okay. I move the board vote to approve the placement of a menorah near the Neil Ellsworth tree on Blake Street. Second. Motion made by Julianne, seconded by Kristen. All those in favor, let's see, Jason. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Julianne. Aye. Scott. Aye. I also vote aye. Vote is unanimous in favor. Susie, thank you very, very much as always. This is uh, one of the biggest highlights of the community for the entire year. And you and your committee seem to be involved with almost all of the highlights of uh, oh, thank you. Of event, events. I'm just, I, know, I know there's a lot of holidays coming up and it's the spring seems far away, but um, we do have kindness week coming up in February. And I would love if the board of selectmen, I'm gonna try to inspire you once again to come up with something or an event or a cause that we could involve with it. Cause we were so excited to partner with the children and the students last year um, in the event. And again, Scott made it safely possible for us to use the town common because there had been a rainstorm and a fast freeze. So there was a, a lot of ice out there, but um, it, we were looking to expand it. And I would love some, if you guys have any ideas, just let me know. But um, I'm, just, I'm trying to be a little early with that, but thank you um, for having me. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. It was good to see you. And I'm, I just... I'm over my panic of Zoom again, but. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susie. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, that concludes that item. Next on our agenda, I know what it is, but I wanna make sure you can read it properly. Uh, next is a public hearing with the Board of Assessors for purpose of discussing the valuation. Well, I will open said public hearing with the Board of Assessors for the purpose of discussing the valuation of each class of property, the minimum residential factor and the allocation of tax burden among the four mm -hmm. classes of real property, residential, open space, commercial and industrial and of personal property. And I know we have a couple of guests for this presentation. I, um, Chris Reedy, I'm going to bring you in. <clears throat> Paul Sabelli, I'm going to bring you in. And is, 
John, is there another name on there? I saw it earlier, but I didn't hear it mentioned in, when we talked just prior to the meeting. Uh, no, yeah. I believe Paul, so Paul uh, uh, and uh, Chris okay. and Jason should, should be in. Okay. Excellent, good evening. You can unmute yourselves if you so desire. And um, I, I don't know who will kick us off and walk us through the presentation. I would be doing that, Mr. Chairman, if that's all right with you. Fantastic. So I did want to acknowledge, you know, uh, Chris Reedy and Paul uh, Sibeli. They, they are members of our uh, Board of Assessors. Uh, also, Jason Little, the uh, Finance Director, is here as well. So uh, under uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 56, uh, we're required to hold this classification hearing uh, with the Board of Selectmen each year. Um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to share my screen. Please. There's a presentation we'll roll through. All right, is that coming through okay? Looks good to me. Thank you. Bear with me one second, doesn't want to advance. Just give me a second. Try that one more time. There we go. So in terms of the agenda this evening, as I said, this is a, a, a statutorily required hearing. Uh, it is a public hearing as well. Um, but in terms of what we'll do tonight, uh, first, we'll just go a little bit of an overview. We're going to talk about just because there are some folks out there that don't understand what classification is. Um, really want to spend some time talking about the uh, town's overall valuation, what's happening, what does it mean? I will then turn the presentation over to uh, Paul Sabelli and Chris Reedy who will go through the uh, rate uh, options and implications for the board. And then last but not least, uh, the meat of tonight is the uh, Board of Selectmen will actually make a policy vote with regard to tax classification, as well as taking up the residential exemption and the small commercial exemption, both of which will be explained uh, down further in terms of the presentation. So in terms of what is classification, allows the community to have a different tax rate for the different classes of property, residential, open space, commercial, industrial, we can shift up to 150%. You know, everybody uh, asks, well, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do this every year? You know, pre-prop two and a half, uh, towns oftentimes used to shift the tax burden um, unofficially by manipulating the data. Um, post, nobody would admit that, but that's what happened. Post-prop two and a half, 1979, 1980, requires this to be a, uh, an open, transparent, and explicit policy decision uh, done publicly. So everybody knows exactly uh, what is happening with the, with the various classes and uh, whether or not everybody's paying their fair share. Um, I think a couple of key concepts we always like to come back to is that uh, tax classification does not raise any additional dollars uh, for the town. In other words, if you would institute this, uh, it does not create any more revenue for us. It just really shifts uh, who pays uh, the tax bill. So it's a policy decision basically to artificially shift the tax burden from one class to another. I mentioned uh, uh, Prop 2.5 that came in 1979, 1980. Um, the town of Northborough, for a variety of uh, reasons, has chosen not to uh, institute classification. Uh, for a big piece of it has been uh, discussions of fairness, but really uh, sustainability in terms of our long-term economic development. That's been the primary focus of not uh, putting any surcharges on businesses as part of our economic development uh, marketing, essentially. So just in terms of what's happening with our uh, values, so new growth, this is a uh, new development as well as personal property uh, that's that gets measured this is um, this is at fifty four point three million dollars. It's important to recognize, you know, that's between July 1, 2021 and June 30th of 2022. As with all assessing data, including values, there's there's always a lag, typically a year lag. So that's important to keep in mind. So as values and things are escalating, we lag behind that when they come down. We lag behind that as well. But right now, uh, all value categories uh, classifications rose. 
Residential values are up 16%, commercial 10, industrial 15. This is really, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, this, but it's really good news for us, the fact that commercial values and industrial values were increasing. Um, previously, we saw residential values going up, but the commercial and industrial values weren't uh, escalating at a similar or comparable rate. And that is a market shift of the tax burden. Same thing happens the opposite if the residential uh, uh, values are dropping, but commercial industrial strong, you get a natural shift. Uh, one of the things when we talk about uh, classification, the making a policy decision to shift these things, uh, you're essentially uh, interfering with the normal market uh, ebbs and flows. Uh, so with a single tax rate, those things take place uh, and uh, the natural values uh, get factored in. The big takeaway from this slide, though, is uh, is that our the net effect of all these values is that the overall valuation of the town is up about five hundred nine million dollars. It's now three point eight nine billion uh, of value. The good news is overall the value of the town's going up. If the value of the town was going down, that would be a, a slightly different discussion. So it shows that uh, we have new growth. In other words, there's new buildings and new value to add and the um, existing residential stock, commercial industry are increasing in value. That's all positive. If you know, uh, in December, when we talk about financial trend monitoring, one of the big things that we track and we, and we watch carefully is what's happening to our tax base and what's happening to our values because taxes, local taxes, real estate, personal property taxes, uh, make up about 80% 80, 81% of the town's budget. So it's very important uh, that we know what that number is and that it's healthy. And so our local uh, our local uh, values, our overall valuation is in a positive place and that's good for the town of Northboro. Now, historically, uh, if, if you go back to like the early 2000s when I started here, um, the uh, split between residential versus commercial industrial properties was about an 80-20 split. So as the town has developed its commercial industrial areas, and we've seen that, uh, and we've realized that economic development, you've seen this natural shift. And it's settled in around 75-25, uh, 75% residential, 25% commercial industrial. And um, I think... Uh, we may see some significant development down the road, but as town as the town of Northboro has really reached largely its build out, there's a few parcels left. Um, we're going to settle in around the 75, 25. That's sort of where uh, the split will be. Um, sometimes you you look at a town like Westboro and they're you know a 60, 40 percent uh, split, uh, so a lot more commercial industrial. Um, so it ebbs and flows, depends on the community, but we generally see one or two points, and it's it's primarily driven by whatever's happening in the market valuations, whether or not one class is up a point or or down a point. Um, so the other thing that I said will push this a little bit is if we were to get significant residential development, uh, I don't see that happening in terms of um, single family homes, but if you were to get a, another, say, Avalon Bay that located 382 units, that would push this a little bit. Uh, or if you saw values shifting through the normal market, they might move around. But basically, by and large, I'd say 75, 25 is where Northboro is going to settle in for the long haul. Now, in terms of new growth, I mentioned $54.3 million. Um, this year, we've seen uh, some, some significant residential new growth. And again, new growth, at least for when we talk about commercial, industrial, uh, in residential, we're talking about real estate growth. These are tangible brick mortar stick buildings that uh, we can we can actually physically touch as opposed to personal property, which I'll get to in a moment. But we saw significant residential development, not in terms of the number, but uh, I believe we had uh, seven houses combined. Those seven houses are worth over $8 million. So not a lot of housing development, but of significant value. Uh, we typically see about eight to 10 single family homes built a year. Um, the base, the balance of that, we saw a little bit more this year, uh, but the balance of that is every time someone builds, uh, remodels their kitchen, uh, puts new siding on, puts an addition on, that's captured in that new growth. In terms of the commercial uh, new growth, uh, the bulk of that, uh, $5.6 million, is actually the soccer facility at uh, 400 
uh, Cedar Hill that went in that that's been captured. So um, uh, that's picked up. And then uh, based on uh, some subdivision uh, that work that they had done up at the Shops Way, that makes up about uh, roughly another three million of that. So it's really between Shops Way and that new facility down on Cedar Hill that makes up that commercial, the bulk of that commercial new growth. And then uh, in terms of industrial, uh, we've seen uh, 50 Southwest cutoff. We've seen a, a couple of million dollars uh, of new uh, structures out there. Uh, 41 Lyman Street, it's another, about another million dollars. And then the balance is made up of, you know, renovations, additions, and so forth. So roughly uh, just under $30 million of total new growth in terms of actual physical instruction. Uh, and then we've uh, realized uh, twenty four and a half million dollars of personal property. So just you know, as a caveat, um, you know, personal property is very different than uh, real estate growth. Uh, real estate growth is actual physical assets, as I've said. Personal property is a formulaic uh, valuation under proposition two and a half. And by the way, new growth, uh, this whole calculation under new proposition two and a half is designed to recognize that if you have additional growth that you may, may likely see additional service demands and therefore it factors into how much your tax levy can increase. But personal property are, uh, are, is, are things primarily like equipment. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, those types of things is a very, is a very big difference between you know, buying computers and, uh, and racking systems versus building a house or a commercial building. Personal property depreciates over time where we generally see, generally, uh, real estate will appreciate with value uh, over time. So we've seen a few accounts there. Uh, that's a pretty significant number this year. Um, we've saw 4.7 million of that 24 and a half is Monster Worldwide, which are uh, servers up at uh, Iron Mountain. Uh, Amazon is responsible for three accounts that make about $8 million. Uh, and then we've seen National Grid, 1.86, McKesson, one and a half, Nucor, FedEx is about a half a million. So you start to see as they invest in new equipment and systems um, within their structures, uh, that number gets captured as new growth. But the reality is it gets depreciated and it tails off pretty, pretty quickly. I don't get very excited about seeing, you know, new growth in the personal property. It, it does help us in terms of the calculation. It does factor into the overall tax bills. But it's um, when you think about hard, sustainable new growth that's going to be here and more than likely appreciate over the years, um, that is uh, that is something that you want to see up on the real estate side. It's always good to have a little context when you talk about things like new growth um, because uh, it ebbs and flows. And uh, oftentimes, if you were to take out large building projects, I think you'd see we'd probably average somewhere in the 30 to $40 million range each year. But you can see, you know, in uh, 2013, 2012, that's when Northboro Crossing went in uh, the, and uh, uh, the mall, essentially. And we saw, you know, record $92 million in new growth. You're never going to see that again. And the simple reason you won't see that again is we don't have that kind of available land. But you can see the big, they're color coded. So you can see when Avalon Bay went in, 382 units near the mall. Uh, that was significant new growth residential component. Uh, then you saw Northborough Crossing go in 2012, 2013. If you look at 2017, that beige piece in the middle, that was the second phase of uh, Northborough Crossing. Uh, and then you can see most recently the um, uh, development that's taken place out on Bartlett Street, the Amazon facility 301 uh, uh, Bartlett Street. So that was one of the last significant areas that the town had set aside and zoned for, for industrial uh, development. And as we've realized that development and it's built out, there's only a handful of parcels left. There's zero Bartlett Street uh, that's uh, left to be developed. And then in terms of larger parcels around town, we have Kimbleson and Gravel out on the Southwest cutoff. That's a 50 acre site that you can see some substantial uh, development at some point. But, uh, you know, it, it, you'll start maybe we'll start to see more uh, redevelopment as we get down. But that's very different than 
you know, someone coming in and building, you know, 600,000 or a million square feet somewhere. Uh, those days are largely behind uh, the town of uh, Northborough. And so, you know, as we, we look at this and we try to forecast, well, what do we think we're going to see for new growth? It's important not to do something as simplistic as just take averages or rolling averages. It's interesting, as noted on the slide, the five-year average is about 52 million. The 15-year average is about 53 million. Nice, those numbers are close together. But the reality is when you when you look at those averages, it takes in consideration development that is not going to come back again or is unlikely to come back again. Avalon Bay, Northborough Crossing, the developments on Bartley Street. As we look forward, um, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see Northborough settle back in. You know, if you look at the years 2015 to 2020, that's kind of what a typical year without a large development looks like. And you're, you know, between real estate and personal property, you know, you're somewhere in the $30 million mark. So it's important to know that because uh, in a few slides, we're going to talk about our levy capacity. But it's important to know that you don't just look back at your history and say, listen, you know, we typically average 52 or 53 million a year in new growth and thinking that's what you're going to be seeing moving forward. In all likelihood, you can see it's tapered off, as we've talked about for the last three years. You're going to probably see that drop back down to that 30 million dollar mark, roughly where we'll hover until something else big happens. Kimball sand and gravel gets developed or we see something else uh, significant happen. So it's good to see this, you know, history. Uh, and it's also good to know, um, I say, historically, I've said, if you were to characterize Northborough, uh, when I came here, I'd say we were a startup. We were growing uh, a lot of economic development, a good amount of uh, residential development. Now we're mature. And so as we approach build out, you're not going to see that kind of growth. So it's a little different mindset when you start planning in terms of the future uh, with regard to uh, budgets and services. You want to make sure that as you, you're no longer growing and you're maturing and you're reaching build out, that you, you're focusing more on sustainability and being able to um, and able to maintain your current level of services and be very cautious about adding staff and expanding services quickly because you're going to have limited growth in your primary revenue source, which is local taxes. Uh, this slide here, uh, we always like to show, we say top ta taxpayers, but just to be clear, it's top taxpayers by location. And this does include uh, personal property uh, at those locations. Uh, we do like to show this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, is if you look at uh, the overall uh, heavy hitters, so to speak, um, you see great diversity. You see retail, commercial, you see industrial uses, you see R&D, you see transportation, you see health insurance, um, you see um, uh, residential, uh, assisted living. So you have all of that mix. And one of the things that you always wanna look for in your tax base is you want to see it growing, you want it stable, but you want it also diversified. So unlike some communities, uh, I think our probably our biggest exposure would be if something were to happen to the mall. Uh, but if but if that's the case, is it likely to happen to every single tenant in that mall? Probably not. We've seen turnover up there, and uh, we actually have seen a lot of uh, reuse. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Sierra is coming up there as a new tenant taking over. We have uh, Home Goods. Uh, we've got a few other um, uh, places. So we've been able to maintain uh, occupancy up in the main uh, part of the mall. That's very positive for us. But when you start looking at the, the rest of these uh, heavy hitters, you know, they're really spread out. And um, just like your personal investment por por portfolio, you want diversification. So as a hedge against, you know, anything bad happening. The other reason why uh, I like to show this slide is we used to always show the top 10 taxpayers. And then as we started growing through our successful economic development, that expanded to the top 15. And then really, we haven't lost anybody off this list what happens is we have new ones coming in. For instance, if you look at number 15, this is uh, the a new development on the Southwest cutoff, the two structures out there. That now came in and knocked Beaumont, Whitney Place off of that 15 uh, slot the, of the 15th uh, largest uh, taxpayer. 
Beaumont and Whitney Place are still there, uh, as is as is um, uh, several other uh, uh, NSTAR, Verizon, uh, all these other ones that have uh, fallen off. The real takeaway uh, from this slide, uh, beyond the diversification and the strength of, of the additions, is the fact that uh, about 60 to 70 percent of the companies that you see in this list have either come to Northboro or expanded in the last 10 years in Northboro. So again, speaks well of our economic development um, uh, initiatives and policies. The companies that come here, they don't come here because we gave them a TIF and as soon as the, the tax increment financing arrangement wears off, they pack up and they go shopping around for another location. Um, these companies all made investments in Northboro. And like I said, 60 to 70% of them either made recent investments or have expanded uh, their operations in Northboro. That's all very positive. Again, it speaks to the, um, the quality of our tax base because, uh, because um, again, 80% of our operating budget that pays for our schools, police, fire, and everything else comes from the physical, the taxing of the physical real estate in the town. So let's talk about single family homes uh, and taxes. If you remember when we took the first pass at the fiscal 23 budget, uh, we were at the fiscal trend monitoring, uh, we were looking at $565 as a tax increase, which is probably the most substantial, is the most substantial in the last 10 plus years. Um, that number uh, then got revised down when we set the final uh, uh, budget that went to town meeting and we estimated somewhere around $513. I'm very happy to say uh, sitting here today that uh, we always show you a worst case, hopefully a worst case scenario, but a few things worked out in our favor. So first of all, market adjustments and growth. We saw, again, good, healthy new growth at fit over 53 million. The other thing that we saw was commercial industrial properties raising. One of the fears was for the last couple of years, what we saw was a very hot real estate market and a suppressed uh, commercial industrial, right? Businesses were closed, retail shops were closed. And so we saw a shifting of the tax burden to the residential as those values escalated. Well, now we're seeing things coming back. And so because of those uh, increases in commercial industrial, it, you don't you didn't see real estate uh, residential take off and commercial industrial down here. They all moved up. And on a relative basis, due to those market valuation changes, again, the residential is up 16, 17 percent, commercials 10 percent, uh, industrials 15 percent. Because of that, you didn't see as big of a shift uh, over on to the residential. Remember, I said we're about 75, 25. We thought originally that we'd see about a two percent shift. Uh, from commercial industrial over to residential, it's really only been about a 1%. Uh, so again, it's hard to uh, predict or to artificially manipulate these regular market ebbs and flows. So that's why we generally historically have not tried to do that. The other thing that's happened is we got a little bit of extra state aid at the end of the day. So you know that knocked 21 bucks off. Um, with that state aid, Algonquin Regional High School also received additional state aid and therefore, our assessment uh, was reduced, re you know, bringing it down another $12. And then there's some other minor adjustments and changes. So the good news is overall, that $513 increase, uh, if you were to choose a single tax rate uh, this evening, uh, is, is estimated to be about uh, $380 for the average single family home. So. Just a little historical perspective on what's happened to the taxes in Northboro over the years. It's funny, uh, um, uh, somebody recently commented to me, uh, compared to our neighboring communities, these numbers are very, very uh, reasonable and mild. Um, but if you start looking at this trend, there's always a story behind these numbers. The five-year average is $247, the 10-year average $239. The one thing that you are going to see, no question about it, is that the average single family tax bill is going to continue to increase. For a lot of the reasons I already talked about, uh, we're reaching build out, you're not gonna see a lot of new growth, but you're also not generally seeing a lot of new state aid. Most state aid increases are going to uh, communities that will benefit under the Student Opportunities Act, which is designed to divert 
uh, state revenues to communities in need for education. So it makes sense that that's where it would be going. So the result is we're not going to see a lot in state aid. Our tax uh, base is going to not grow as much in the future. But let me just tell you the story. So you look at this line and go back to 2014, $44 increase. I mean, that was the, um, the second the second phase of the mall came in that year. And that was also during the real estate bust, uh, where single family home values were still plummeting. That thing started to turn around in 2016 and 2017. You can see $247, $242. Uh, $242. Um, uh, that's the Lincoln Street School Building Project. That was a $14.85 million project that we were responsible for. It's 25 overall, but we bonded that project. So that's where you saw that increase there. Um, in fiscal 19 and 20, we saw significant shifts in the number of kids going to Algonquin Regional High School relative to Southboro. So our assessment, our single largest bill, essentially, uh, for the high school was going up eight to 9% in those years. And then you hit 21, that's the pandemic, and the budgets were cut back, and we consciously made an effort to provide some tax relief to everybody, residential, commercial, industrial. So our tax, the average single family tax bill actually went down $65. And now uh, now you start to look at, you know, what are we really looking at in terms of a typical increase for maintaining our current level of services? And it's hovering around $300. Now the, the 380, a piece of that is, you know, what we've seen the last couple of years is uh, single family home values are escalating. Well, uh, with interest rates, you're seeing that market cool off. Um, but as we start to look forward, and again, we'll get into more of this at the financial trend monitoring meeting in December, is uh, we've got some significant building projects that are coming. We have a fire station, a town hall, eventually a Peasley School. Um, White Cliffs is in the mix, whether or not that is uh, you know, general, you know, general fund tax dollars remains to be seen. But all the pressure moving forward is going to be on the, on the tax bill. But you can see historically, we've managed ourselves uh, very well and uh, very reasonable. It, in terms of a typical year, a typical year for us budgetarily, we need about a three and a half percent increase to main the, maintain the current level of services. And that translates into about a $300 tax increase uh, for the average single family home. Just a little bit of context. Uh, this slide here uh, is important to note that uh, we have unused levy capacity. Now, there's a few things that I want to bring uh, to light here. Uh, the reason why you have un, uh, unused levy capacity, and this didn't materialize over, overnight, this has been building for the last 10 years, is uh, two things. One, um, the town of Northborough has not taxed to the max of Prop 2.5. And we haven't because we've had good economic development. So that economic development has come in, provided new tax revenues to the to, to the organization and has allowed us uh, not to have to raise taxes immediately to limits of Prop 2.5 like some of our neighboring communities. Uh, the second point is I want to be clear about is, you know, this is not money in the bank. Um, this is basically taxing capacity in order to in order to access any of our levy capacity, it simply means you're raising taxes. Now, I'm from Connecticut. In Connecticut, there's no Prop 2 and a half. So you raise the taxes to the amount that you need for your budget that's acceptable to the voters. In Massachusetts, is Proposition 2 and a half. If we had no levy capacity and you needed more money, that's when you'd have to go to the voters uh, through town meeting and the ballot and seek an override. So, um, so this money, uh, when we again meet in December to go over the financial trend monitoring, when we talk about our fiscal forecasting, our forecast looking forward five years always takes into consideration that in order to maintain the current level of services, we are likely going to need to start dipping into that levy capacity. And you want to do that you know, ju judiciously uh, because every time you do, it will raise you know, the tax bill. But we are in the very enviable position to have levy capacity, which means if we need additional funds to, in order to maintain our current level of services, we, we need town meeting approval, but we wouldn't need a proposition two and a half override at the ballot. 
Uh, this slide here uh, uh, brings everything together, uh, all the variables I've talked about, the values of the different uh, types of uh, real estate, um, the tax rate, the uh, changes in the average single family home value, and then what the average tax bill is done. So you can see total, eva total valuation is up about 15% or $509 million. Um, the interesting thing is as the values go up, you know, the tax rate uh, will go down. So the tax rate will, if again, you choose a single, a single rate, uh, it will go down this year. And then the single family home values are up, you know, 17% or a little over $82,000. That's pretty remarkable uh, in a short time span. Um, again, we see that residential market um, cooling off now as interest rates go up um, and uh, that market will start to cool off a little bit. But when you look at all these variables, they all factor into the only thing that anybody cares about, and that's what's happening to the average single family uh, tax bill. And so here you can see it's up about 4.6% or $380. So that brings everything together in one slide. Again, very reasonable. If you're following the news, I'm not going to name names, but most of the communities surrounding us are in the seven to $800 range. And again, the same factors that are uh, impacting Northboro in terms of uh, uh, single family home values in that hot market is the same thing that's uh, impacting these other communities as well. Everybody around us is also was originally forecasting higher tax bills, but I think their commercial industrials come up as well. And so that shift hasn't been as strong as it potentially could have been. So summary, uh, just some summary points to take away. We have a very, uh, the town's overall valuation is up over $500 million. We have a very good tax base. It's very diversified and continues to grow. Those are all positive trends for us. It means we have taxing capacity. Um, new growth is uh, certified at a little over 54 million. Again, that's positive. It means that we're continuing to grow our tax base, which is our number one revenue source. And then last but not least, again, based on any metric that you can come by, the tax impact is reasonable given the alternatives. And I think it's important to look around at the surrounding communities and you'll see that the tax impact in Northboro has been very reasonable. Uh, and that's by design with conservative budgeting coupled with good economic development has allowed us to keep that uh, reasonable. Um, also, uh, the tax impact is in line uh, reasonably uh, with what the forecast was uh, around this time last year. Again, it's very difficult to figure out all the variables that are in motion between single family home values, commercial industrial budget, state aid. So we always try to give a, a, a worst case scenario in terms of the tax impact and hope that uh, the things come out in our favor which it did. So uh, basically there's no surprises in terms of the, the overall single family home tax bill or the valuations. Everything is relatively in line with the forecasts that we predicted. So uh, unless anybody has any questions uh, about the material that I covered, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Sibeli and Chris Reedy, our assessors, uh, board of assessors. And uh, the second piece of the agenda is for them to go through the tax rate options and the implications for you. And then last but not least, the board will then have a discussion and vote. Um, but uh, through the chair, would you like to continue with the presentation and deal with the questions after? Or would you like to pause um, and ask I, any questions? I prefer to see uh, if there are any questions from the board um, okay. for, for you, John, on the presentation thus far. And I will say, I can't see everyone on my screen right now. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd say just yell out. I have a question. Sure. So our largest growth this year and maybe last year came from personal property tax. Yes. When you look at that graph, um, what, so if you look at the top 10, 15 taxpayers, yes. are you saying that their valuation includes their personal property tax? Yes, yes. In general, there's a lot of little ins and outs, um, but, uh, but generally, yes, yes. And how is that reported? 
is that like an honor system? Like if I'm a, a business, I say I have five new computers. Like how is that? How is that audited or how is it? Regular? Yeah, actually, if uh, I would defer to Paul Sibeli. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> yes. This is what he does day in and day out. Paul, by the way, is the full time principal assessor in Southborough and graciously agreed to serve on our board of assessors. So he's a great resource for us. They twisted my arm. What can I say? Very hard. Uh, just to get to the answer to that question, the, um, uh, hold on a sec here. Hold on a lot. I can't hear. We can hear you. You can hear me. Hold on a second. Okay, back to the question. It was personal property. Again, Julianne, can you just reiterate the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So we, so we have a basketball game or something going below us here at Town Hall. <laughs> I can kind of hear. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Who's who's winning? Um, I don't so, know. <laughs> so I was wondering how how personal property tax is assessed. Um, sure. Basically, it's form of lists that come in. Okay, so we mail out form of lists annually. Um, we also have a personal property consultant who goes out and visits properties for anything that's new growth. Um, they also have to go through once every five years. Um, and typically what businesses do is they submit an asset report. Any, any big company is just, we get an asset report from, the, um, from the, their accounting. Um, and that's that's how we determine. It goes to our personal property uh, people, and they determine what's taxable and what isn't. Okay, so um, would you know the average, just like the average bill for um, you know a small commercial business? Leanne, I've only been here about three months, so I really can't answer that. Would have to get back to you on that one. I'm I sorry. Can, well, I can answer that. It runs. Yeah, John has it in front. Of I me. mean, it, I have it. It runs from again. Uh, from $150 up to $4.7 million, depending on the size of your, uh, I'm sorry, from $150 up to, you know, $70,000. 70, uh, oh. uh, the value, uh, again, I'm looking at just the new, just the new growth component of it, but it, it runs the gamut from $100 up into, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands, potentially. Okay. All right. Julianne, thank you. Julianne, typically it's, it's just a handful that you'll get a lot of new growth from. Mm -hmm. It's typically, you know, maybe 20% that you get the vast majority of the value from most of them. I mean, you know, you drive around North, but it's mostly small businesses. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just share in terms of the new growth. This isn't the overall, but the, the names will sound familiar. It's Amazon, Mass Electric, McKesson, Newcore, FedEx, Iron Mountain, BJ's, a lot of the same ones that are in that top, top 10 list. You get most of your uh, personal property from from those and again, not to be confused with motor vehicle excise, which is a separate tax altogether. Okay, okay. thank you. Good. Any other questions from the board on the first part of the presentation? You can yell out if. Um, John, I have one question. Um, maybe for for Jason a little bit. I'll, I'll let you decide. Uh, I'm curious about the calculation of the estimated tax bills that go out. So towns, because we, we're we halfway through the fiscal year, essentially now, we have already billed two of the four quarters of tax for the current fiscal year. I'm curious whether whether we base those first two on 25% of last year's or whether we based on 25% of, of some calculation of an estimate for this year. And the reason I'm, cu I'm curious about that is Will for people's next two quarters, will they see an increase because of the 380 or a decrease because of dropping down from the 500 and change down to 380. I'll, I'll let Jason respond to that one, the, the finance director. Oh yeah, um, well, thanks for that question. It's a very good question. Um, the, the first uh, two quarters bills are estimated bills and those are based on um, one quarter of what last year's tax bill was. So we generally, you are going to see um, an increase in, in the actual bill when that comes through, if you're, if you're paying your, your, your tax bill and it's not being escrowed by your, your mortgage company. So for an average property taxpayer, what they will see is one half of the 380 in each of the next two bills. 
But correct. correct. Yeah, I, I've, I've been part of situations where people get scared about the sudden mid-year increase. And it's really because that 380 needs to get spread over two quarters instead of four. And it's just correct. the way it's done. The, yeah, the, I, there's I, also the effect of if, if somebody has some unique characteristics, like a betterment on their bill, we, we do bill out the actual betterments on the with, with the estimated bill. So th there is some fluctuation. It's, it's not a, a straight line across the right. board, but yeah. But yeah, you, you are correct with you with your explanation of. of and again, keep in mind, budget. last year's increase was two ninety five, so now we're going to three eighty. So it's the you know, mm -hmm. unlike some of the other communities where it could be several hundred dollars, that's not the case here. At least not this year. Okay. I just think it's worth worth a discussion about the the uh, eccentricities of how those are done, and that's not a that's not at fault of us. That's just how the state makes us do things. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, assuming there are no other questions from the board on the first part of the presentation, I'd like to continue. All right, so I'll hand it over to Paul and uh, Chris. All right, so I guess I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, so the first option uh, that we're looking at, which is the most popular uh, that you hear people talk about is a split rate um, tax scenario. And this shifts burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes better known as the CIP. Uh, just again, any shift amount does not raise any additional revenues. John mentioned that earlier in the presentation. And just a little quick fact for you, in FY22, 69.5% of the Massachusetts communities had a single tax rate. So what we're gonna do is just look at a uh, split tax uh, rate scenario. This is a 5% shift. So if you look at the top box, it'll show you what we currently are at our 1479. Uh, should we continue with a single rate? Again, you see the uh, average assessed value for a single family condo, commercial and industrial, and the tax bill uh, implications there. Uh, now, if we do a 5% shift moving down, again, you're going to use the same assessments. Um, it will uh, shift the tax rate. You'll see the residential tax rate go down uh, slightly. I believe it's about 26%, uh, 26 cents. And again, this is a 5% shift. Um, and as a result, it would uh, push burden off or push burden onto the commercial, industrial and personal property. Um, and their rate would increase to 1553. Uh, and it, it'll show the difference of the uh, impact of the shift uh, in the far right uh, column. So just just to reiterate, the split tax rate at a 5% shift means a savings of $151 for the average single family home taxpayer and can increase of $1,320 and $3,701 for the average commercial and industrial taxpayer, respectively. Um, Excuse me, uh, Paul? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just wanted to ask sure. a clarifying question. Sure. Uh, Paul, if you could just explain, you're, you're referring here to a 5% shift. Could you explain exactly what that is relative to the like overall tax levy? So again, it's not going to change the overall levy. Okay, you got to be careful with the levy. The levy is going to stay the same. It's really just shifting burden. And again, it's done through the tax rates uh, to take uh, a, a bit of savings off the residential and onto the commercial, and industrial, and personal property. Again, as John had mentioned, be very, very careful. A lot of people think if you shift, it's going to change the overall levy, and it's not. It's just who's paying what, how you're splitting up the pie, I guess would be the best way of, of uh, putting it. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, partially. Um, I guess uh, I just wanted to be clear about uh, what are we talking about in terms of uh, dollars? Uh, what does 5% represent here? As far as... I'm not quite uh, as, understanding you. Well, we're talking about 5% of the burden being shifted from residential to uh, commercial industrial, right? Right, so it's not gonna change the assessments or anything. Again, it's just a calculation right. that we go through. You can change it 1%, 2%, 3%, all the way up to, what are we, 150, I think here in North, bro. Um, and again, it's just a calculation, I guess is the best way of uh, putting it. John, you wanna add anything to that? It's... Uh, um, uh, what are you trying to get at, Jason? What do we... Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to understand uh, if you have a certain amount of tax burden, say on commercial and industrial, uh, which which comes from the single tax rate, uh, 
Um, the 5% represents what? It represents a 5% increase of that single rate burden that is added to the commercial industrial? It shifts proportionally. Um, so it's not a straightforward 5% down for residential and 5% up for commercial industrial. And um, we'll get to this a little later, but one of the reasons why um, the split rate is not favored um, in towns with a lower amount of commercial industrial is that the building, the properties have to pay more in tax, real estate tax. When they go for financing or sale, it will decrease the value of the property because more expense is being incurred paying that tax. So in the long run, it ends up the uh, burden will eventually be shifted back to residential. Uh, okay, thank you. We can proceed. We all set? Yeah, please continue. Well, okay, we next slide. Yep, just bear with me a second. I don't know why. Sometimes when I stop sharing, it doesn't want to advance. So let me bring it back up again. Sorry about that. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay, so the residential exemption and the small commercial exemption, unlike the split rate option that shifts burden from one class to another, both the residential and small commercial exemptions shift burden within the class. As with a split tax rate, no additional taxes are raised by either of these exemptions. <clears throat> okay, and I just wanna mention, although Northboro is not likely candidate to adopt either of these two exemptions, they must be presented and a formal vote must be taken by the Board of Selectmen to complete our classification hearing. A lot of people wonder why we have to present them, but again, in order to complete the uh, uh, our meeting tonight uh, that the, the state requires us to do so and, and take votes. So let's first talk about the residential exemption. Okay, shifts tax burden within the residential class from lower assessed properties to seasonal, rental, and higher assessed properties. Um, accepting this option raises the residential tax rate only. So be careful, it does not do anything to the commercial or industrial rates or personal property rates. Uh, again, residential only. Allo allowed only on residential properties that is taxpayers' primary residence. Typically, this exemption is adopted in areas with a low rate of owner occupancy. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, communities with lots of rental properties would be like Boston and Cambridge. They both have it. Or lots of seasonal properties. You'll find this down the Cape. Barnstable and Nantucket would be examples of that. If adopted, the residential exemption may be up to 35% of the average assessed value of all parcels. Um, only 16 of 351 cities and towns adopted the residential exemption last year. Um, and the example we have here is a 10% uh, estimated with a 10% exemption, and it runs through the scenarios. I'm not going to really get into them because, um, again, it really doesn't apply to uh, a town like Northboro. But the bottom box, you want to look at any owner occupied home assessed at 597, 537 or higher would pay more the exemption uh, than without. Your next slide. <clears throat> Small commercial exemption, if adopted, exempts up to 10% of the value of the commercial parcels with an average annual employment of no more than 10 people at all locations and having a valuation of under a million dollars. Exempted taxes are shifted to other commercial and industrial properties. Uh, exemption is for the property owner, not for the small business owners. Um, so just remember that uh, for tenant-based properties. Again, you're going to see it's not very popular. 14 of 351 cities and towns adopted this exemption in FY22. You have to have a pretty big industrial uh, base for this to work. Um, and again, it's just not a popular thing. John, back to you. Okay. Sorry, I'm not sure why my does not want to slide. So, apologize for this. I'm not sure why the slide doesn't want to advance for me. 
Okay. Well, we're on the last slide anyway. So uh, we're back to the Board of Assessors recommendation. So actually, Paul and Chris, if you want to speak to this. Sure. Um, the board uh, recommends maintaining a single tax rate and not ex uh, adopting the residential exemption or the small commercial exemption. And are there any questions on our recommendations? This is a public hearing. Uh, before we open it up to the public, I'd like to see if any members of the board have any, any initial comments or questions. We will return to board discussion. Julianne. So um, when we get these presentations, commercial properties are always bundled with industrial. But is it possible to separate out the two? And just, just as an example, I just um, want, this is really just uh, curiosity. Could you could you have a different tax rate for commercial properties and a different tax rate for industrial? The state doesn't allow for that. Okay. As you can imagine, under Prop Two and a Half, this is all very heavily regulated and formulaically driven process. So there's. We don't have options to do things that we would like to do. Uh, we have to follow the statute. So, so a small business is considered in the same pool as a, a multi-million dollar industry. It is a commercial uh, property and land use, and that's how the state defines it. Okay, thank you. No, you're welcome. Any other comments or questions before we open it up to any public comment? Okay, uh, if any members of the public would like to say a few words, raise your virtual hands, please. Yeah, I see one hand up thus, oh, I saw a hand up and then it went away. There we go, it's back again. All right, I'm going to recognize uh, Karen Chapman. Karen, if you could unmute yourself and identify uh, who you're calling from, please. Good evening. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak tonight. My name's Karen Chapman and I'm the president and CEO of the Quarter 9495 Regional Chamber of Commerce. And we do represent the town of Northborough amongst four other towns of Westboro, Southboro, Shrewsbury and Grafton. And we serve as a voice for the business community. And each and every year, we, we do come before the board to talk about maintaining a single tax classification. You know, the backbone of your economy still remains to be small business. And um, regardless of what the economy is, you know, and I understand that the economy right now continues to see challenges, both if you're a resident or a commercial. But for the commercial community right now, and that's your business community, as they continue to navigate out of coming out of uh, COVID and we're still in the COVID-19 pandemic, they're dealing with inflation like everyone is, but they're also dealing with major workforce challenges and supply chain difficulties. Right now, the last thing that they would look, be looking for is an increase in their expenses. Um, the town of Northborough has flourished over the years because of your business friendly climate for new business growth and for job creation, existing businesses, and obviously some expansion. And you know, with your public budget, mostly um, for the public schools, um, I'd like to say which businesses don't add to the cost of. I, I think maintaining a single tax classification does put a message out to your community that you continue to be friendly towards business and an open climate and to attract new business. Now, and I understand that a lot of you have had built out here in Northboro, but I also think that your small business community continues to struggle. And um, there was an employer survey done by an economic development partner of the chamber. And the number one challenge cited by employers was obviously workforce challenges. And that is certainly continues to be a problem here. And in most cases, employers are having to pay more than they've ever had to pay just to try to recruit and to uh, find um, people to run their businesses. So it's a tough time in the economy and it's a tough time for everyone, but I will say for business, it's very tough time to run your business right now. 
So I would like to also say that the business community has been a very good supporter when it comes to playing a key role in contributing to the quality of life of your community. And they are good for, uh, they are wonderful contributors to your scholarships for your students and grants for your schools and for donations to your food pantry and sponsors of your athletic and community events, such as the Big Apple Fest um, community event that you have every year. As business continues to struggle, they may not be able to afford to give generously. And if they're, and if they're gonna be out of business or have moved out of town, they will not be here to give anything at all. Um, I firmly believe that by maintaining a single tax rate, Northboro will continue to attract and retain businesses in your community and promote de development, business development in your town. And thank you for your opportunity to speak. Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. And Karen, if you can do me a favor and lower your hand, unless you'd like to be recognized again a little bit later. And I have, thank you. Uh, and I have, again, I had someone else with a hand up. There we go, mm -hmm. back again. I wonder if Zoom is, is confusing. Uh, for Maselli, who I suspect is Lisa Maselli again, uh, being recognized, please. Uh, Lisa Maselli, 13 Maple Street. Thank you for recognizing me as for Maselli, Mitch. Um, I'm just going to uh, just say that the chamber does come in every year and, and speaks for their members. And, um, and I think that's, um, that's very lovely. But who speaks for the resident? How often do you have somebody come in and speak for the resident? And, um, and I think that, uh, that the seniors especially are, are suffering just as much, if not more, because we're all on fixed income. And, um, and there is no real break for us, even the, even the senior program doesn't really help much. And I'm wondering if there wouldn't be a, a help with that shift. We'd all be able to enjoy that $151 this year to be able to probably buy a half week's worth of groceries. But, um, but I do think it, it bears saying that the residents have burdened with 75% of the taxes. And I think that it's, uh, it's something that should be considered. So um, I thought I'd just throw that out there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your comments. I don't see any other hands up. Um, if anyone else would like to be recognized, this is a good time. Okay, well, we're waiting to see if any other hands go up. I have one, one additional question. Um, and probably for the assessors, there's, it's, it's only somewhat related. Um, I know you have a number of uh, senior tax discount programs, if you will, uh, for people who are, for, for seniors with, at a low income, for uh, certain disabled residents, for veterans and things like that. And those are all driven by the state. We can't create, craft our own arbitrarily. Um, one of them that I, I've I'm very curious about is, I think it's called 41A, it's a tax deferral. And I believe Northboro has the lowest threshold that you really need to be not only a senior, but but a very, very, very low income um, to qualify for that. I'm wondering if the Board of Assessors has ever discussed raising that, uh, or if you view that as, as a Board of Selectmen decision and not an assessor's decision. I, I'm not expecting any action tonight uh, on that by any means. Mitch, I'll take that question. Um, one of the things is I'm still relatively new. Chris hasn't been on all that long. Um, so we, we are definitely going to review those. Let's talk specifically to the tax deferral program. Excellent program. Here's the problem in Northboro. Yes, you are correct. We are going to look at some of the limits um, because some of the versions, you can uh, adjust those. Uh, but you know what I see the biggest problem with that is that when that was uh, when that came about, the interest rate on that was 8%. Okay, most towns, they gave a uh, local option to reduce that most towns did reduce that and I don't believe we ever have over in Southboro we reduced it down to 4% maybe eight, nine years ago, which is about the time when most towns did that. Um, and then, then again, two years ago, we reduced it down to 2%. That to me is going to be one of the keys. And the other one is obviously what you spoke about um, and Southboro did raise those as well. Uh, I have a version in Southboro. We're certainly going to bring that over to Northboro. 
um, and take a look at it. What we're hoping to do in the next 30 to 45 days, I had mentioned it with uh, John and Jason, is to take a look at the exemptions really quick to see if any of these limits can be raised. Again, there's many different versions that allow you to do so um, and try to get them as updated um, as possible, especially the tax deferral. I mean, it's just a great program and, and it's a great option uh, as opposed to uh, a reverse mortgage or something like that that comes with a lot of cost. Um, and, and where, uh, you know, equity is obviously rising because values are rising. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity and I think it's very rarely used here in town. I would just add through the chair, uh, that clause uh, 41A would require town meeting action, if I'm not mistaken. So that, that particular one would have to get uh, packaged up for town meeting. So I think just about all of them, John, have to go through. If you're going to adopt different versions, Mitch, you have to go back to town meeting because it is uh, ultimately the legislative body that does decide that. Um, and like I say, we'll, we'll try to put together a few um, to get them through to you guys to make a decision if you want to move them forward. Um, and, and hopefully, I, I think everybody, when you look at some of these limits, would would definitely uh, want to do so. Yeah, yeah. Particularly as as taxes are increasing, we we Absolutely. want to keep seniors in town. Um, you know, allow them to to live in place if that's if that's their preference, and this gives them a a, a really creative tool to uh, to be able to do that. So yeah, I look forward to hearing back from you um, when you can. Thank you. Um, Okay, I haven't seen any other hands up, so I think it is an opportune time to perhaps close the public hearing and get to our deliberations on the uh, the matters at hand. Would someone like to make a motion to close the public hearing? Mr. Chairman, I move that we close the public hearing. Second. Okay, motion been made, I think, by Julianne, seconded by Jason. Uh, any discussion on closing the public hearing? If not, all those in favor, uh, Julianne? Aye. Scott? Aye. Preston? Aye. Jason? Aye. I also vote aye. Public hearing is closed. Um, members of the board have uh, any opinions or, or additional questions that they would like to ask on the uh, tax decisions at hand? Uh, I saw Julianne's hand first. And I'm, I'm sorry, um, Paul. I, the first part of your answer to Mitch's question, when you talked about interest rates, I, I'm, I'm not clear what you were referring to. Were you referring to reverse mortgages? Now the tax deferral program, the town charges an interest rate. Okay. And, and again, it was set by the state at 8% originally when the program came about. Now realize interest rates were probably 9, 10 back in the day when that was set. Okay. So it's an interest rate that they charge. That, you, that the town charges. Um, again, the towns had the option to reduce that, and we do. You could reduce it all the way down to zero. Uh, there's actually a community in town. I, I want to say it's either Framingham or Westboro. It might be Westboro that actually has a zero percent. Not that I would recommend a zero percent and give away, you know, let people borrow uh, without anything, but that would be up to uh, obviously you people putting forward a number. Um, but yes, it is definitely an interest rate is charged. Yes. So Can you I, give us a, like an example of that? I, maybe I could explain a little bit of what it is from more of a layperson's perspective. Yeah. Um, this is something I learned about about a year ago. Um, the 41A tax deferral um, system allows seniors below a certain income threshold, and that's what is potentially adjustable to us, to simply defer their property taxes. So they can say, this year, I don't want to pay potentially any property taxes. Again, if you were a uh, income qualified senior. And then the town essentially adds something to the deed at the registry of deeds to require that to be held, to be paid back at some future date. And that could be paid back the following year. It could even be paid back after the death of the property owner as part of transferring the property, selling the property to somebody else, uh, the same way that a lien on a property would be paid back. And I think what Paul was talking about is the interest rate that is charged for that tax deferral. Uh, so the towns are eventually made whole, plus including that level of interest, which the town can set. I hadn't thought about the, I, I was pretty familiar with the, the deferral process, but not the interest rate adjustment. That's interesting. Um, so that's where the interest rate comes into play is when a tax is deferred 
and paid back at some future date. What's the interest rate that the town gets on, on that deferment? And Julianne, you. Julianne you, can, you can defer up to 50% of the right. value of your home, up to 50% of the value and assessed value of your home. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, yes, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, uh, Scott, I had recognized your hand up next and then Kristen, just a millisecond thereafter. Yeah, thank you, Mitch. Um, I'm trying to remember some uh, you know, prior years we've discussed this and we come up with you know examples and kind of what, what applies to some towns. And something's tickling in the back of the, my memory that if we were to begin to do a split tax rate, that then it begins a, a sort of a feedback loop in that as you increase the taxes on the businesses, you drive less new growth in business, which means you've got to tax the residents at a higher level because business has declined. And so it, it, it ends up leveling back and putting the burden back on the residents anyway, because it stifles that new growth. If I basically got that concept correct? In you that? Yeah, in general, yes. Um, it may discourage a company from coming to town. And also, as you said, it becomes a feedback loop where it, business is apt to move and move out. Um, and the burden that's deferred has to be paid by someone. In that case, it's the residential. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Kristen? I, I didn't actually have a question. Oh. I, okay. I just was reaching for my notebook, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I, I, since noon. No one has really expressed an, an opinion uh, in that opportunity. I'll go first. Um, I do not favor changing to a split tax rate. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the simple version is given our split to save a dollar for residential property owners, which I would love to do. We have to increase the taxes on the commercial and industrial park property owners, $3, give or take. And um, I, I, I think that's. Oh, that's a bit rough. Um, and I think it can have some of the ill effects that we're warned about. Obviously, it works for some communities. I think about 30% of communities in Massachusetts have a split tax rate. I, you know, I don't know the, the details of the splits. If it works well for them, it works well for them. I don't think it would work well for Northboro. Um, I do think, you know, as John, you mentioned earlier, we're essentially at build out or very near build out for large commercial or industrial facilities. Um, some people may think, hey, once you get pretty close to that, go ahead and do a split because, well, you, you know, you're not going to drive away the new growth that you don't really need. Um, we need a lot of new growth on the small business side. And, um, and that is an area that I, I hope we can do more things to pay attention to as a board in coming years. And, um, uh, and there would certainly be, be effects, ill effects of that, both for the small businesses that uh, would own the property that they would be in, as well as the, um, the rental property, you know, the commercial uh, property owners that then lease out space to small business owners. Um, along our, our main street and vicinity, um, you know, that'll trickle, trickle down very quickly to the cost of rent and the impact on the small businesses. So, so that's the calculation that I went through to figure that out. Um, I know that this is a, a stressful discussion every year for a number of business owners and people with, with interests on all sides, both business and uh, personal side. Um, it's frustrating that we have to vote this every year, but we have to vote this every year. Um, so that's that's about where I stand on it. I'm, I'm happy to hear from, of course, any member of the board on any additional thoughts. Julianne, mm -hmm. uh, you are muted. It's been a couple of meetings since I've had to tell somebody they were muted. I, I apologize. I have a point right. of order question. Um, oh. uh, I was not assigned the motion to close the hearing and I wasn't specific. So do you want the motion read by Kristen in, in its entirety? Oh, uh, that, and that may have been my fault that the, the suggested motion was simultaneous to close the hearing and, uh, well, I, I don't know that one, John, do you, 
the suggested motion listed out all of the same reasons that we opened the public hearing. Do you yeah. think we need to motion it that way? I think we it's close, fine. We, you just need to close the. You need to do you need to close the public hearing formally. Yes. Um, yeah, which uh, we've done. Which you've done. I think you're yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that that clarification. Okay. Thank you, Julianne. Um, any other questions or comments on whether whether or not to make any adjustments or you know, anyone feels about it? Jason. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just uh, voice my continued support for a single tax rate. I think it's the fairest approach that we have. Uh, I think the uh, potential complications of the dual tax rate have already been mentioned. Uh, the, the one remaining thing I would point out about that is if you look at the relative proportions of our residential versus commercial and industrial, you have like 75% residential versus something like 25% commercial and industrial. And the, uh, as we've noted, the impact uh, to, to shift a certain amount of money to produce a certain amount of savings on the residential side has kind of a disproportionate effect on the commercial industrial side and the increase that's, uh, that occurs over there. Um, and so if, if we were a community that, you know, we're closer to 40% <laughs> commercial industrial, maybe there'd be more capacity there to, to consider something like that. But I think where we are right now doesn't, doesn't recommend for, for doing a dual tax rate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, if there are no other comments or questions, I'll entertain a motion. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to maintain a uniform tax rate for all classes of property at a factor of one, to oppose the implementation of a residential exemption and to oppose the implementation of a small commercial exemption. Second. Motion made by Scott, seconded by Jason. Any other discussion? All those in favor, uh, Julianne? Aye. Scott? Aye. Jason? Aye. Kristen? Aye. I also vote aye. Vote is unanimous in favor. I want to say thank you very much to our Board of Assessors, who I know have a very hard and busy job. Uh, and um, uh, so thank you very much for joining us this evening and uh, and giving us the lay of the land on this. Thank you and happy holiday. You're welcome and likewise. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Okay, next on our agenda, we have reports. Let's see, hold on, sorry, I'm moving around on my screen here. Uh, Kristen, do you have any reports? Yes, I do. Um, okay. Congratulations to the cast and crew of Guys and Dolls, by all accounts, a great Algonquin musical production put on last weekend. Um, also, great job to the girls' soccer team at Algonquin for making it to the finals. We are super proud of you. Um, so, Northboro um, did uh, scouting for food last weekend, and I got some statistics from Rod Fanestale from Troop 101. He said, um, Scout VSA Troops 823, 1 and 101, along with Club Pack 55 and many Girl Scout troops, including 1176, joined together to support the Northboro Food Pantry. Um, the North Row community really stepped it up this year. He said the amount of food donated was over 14,000 pieces, surpassing any amount he can recall. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you, North Bro. Um, I was wondering if Becca could give us a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, committee update, just quick before I continue? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I know uh, people are anxiously awaiting our first meeting as a fully formed permanent committee. I just received notification from uh, Rhoda Webb at the, at the high school that the Coalition for Equity has formally appointed Deirdre Writing as their representative to the DEIB committee. So that was the last outstanding like third party appointment that we were waiting on. I'm super excited that it's Deirdre because she was a part of the initial committee and I think that she'll be 
a great asset for us. So um, now that we have a full complement, I'm gonna hopefully reach out after the Thanksgiving holiday to set up our first meeting. So it's, uh, it's definitely forthcoming soon. Great, great. Thank you. That is good news about Deirdre. I'm really happy to hear that. Thanks, Becca. Um, and then, um, okay. And then I have, um, obviously, the ARPA money is on everyone's mind. I've been asked about a few different things. Um, one of them is electronic voting at town meeting. Um, is this something that we would need to vote on at town meeting before we pay for it and then do it at the next town meeting? And would it be appropriate to invite um, our town clerk to a meeting soon to talk about options? Not sure who I'm asking, I guess, John. Um, I think the first stop would be uh, the moderator. Um, who runs town meeting? So, um, oh, I thought I thought it was it, okay. Yeah, and that would that would take uh, a quite a bit of work to. I mean, we want to put to, we'd have to look at what the options are, uh, what the budget for that would be, uh, whether or not the moderator is interested in going in that direction. Um, so I know, and I was particularly um, not not risky but complicated. Uh, open town open meeting. Town meeting. Um, you see that more in representative town, town meeting. Yeah, representative town meeting where you you have a known in advance number of voters. Um, it's easy easy ish to implement, and a number have done so for open town meeting. It's a lot harder because you don't know. Gee, do you have to buy a hundred little voting gadgets or a thousand little voting gadgets, and how do you assign them to people and, and so forth? It's, but I, yeah. my understanding, South Bro just did it, and I realize they're smaller than we are, but. Um, they they do have some good ideas over there, and I I don't think we should be intimidated by the idea that it's a pain in the neck. I think a pain in the neck is our job. So I would like to discuss it further. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm fine if we uh, if we wanted to invite the moderator to a, an upcoming meeting. Um, I don't know whether it's feasible to discuss in advance of the April town meeting or whether we should think about it. Uh, you know, for the, for the following one, I'll, I'll let the moderator make that call. Okay. Um, another issue is we've been getting a lot of emails and I saw in the chief's, uh, police chief's report this month, people are um, anxious about speeding and accidents on their streets. They feel like the roads aren't safe. So I was, um, I would like to add a discussion item to our ARPA list that we talk about more financial resources to give to the Northboro police so they can have more of a presence and keep and keeping the roads safe. With more and more development, there are more cars and trucks on the roads and we need to balance our budget with the new reality of all the businesses that are in our town. I'm glad to hear so many businesses are doing so well right now. Um, also, what is the next step in changing our name to select board? I didn't hear back after I asked last time, but if we need to vote on it at town meeting, let's make sure that's high on our board radar. Okay. Is that on everyone's to-do list? Who needs to have it on their to-do list? Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm the board mom tonight. Um, also, the Troop 101 wreath sale is ongoing. Um, the wreaths are $15 each. The link is on a lot of places on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, I would be happy to email you the link. So if you wanna email me and let me know, I'm happy to do it. I ordered mine yesterday, it took me 30 seconds and the wreaths are delivered to your door. Um, Mine will probably be delivered to my door in my own car since my son will be one of the deliverers. Um, and my last quote is by myself. Um, I remember doing this last year and I think it was a good idea. In this month of November of recognizing gratitude, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who keep the town of Northboro ticking, all the PTO parents, all the school library volunteers, all the coaches in every sport in this very sporty town. 
every member of a board commission and or committee is a volunteer, including the four elected boards in town, the two school committees, Northborough and regional and the planning board. So a thank you to my four, a special thank you to my four fellow members of this board for all the hard work you do. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's see, Jason, do you have any reports? Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, just briefly, uh, uh, we had the um, state election conducted on Tuesday, November 8th, and I just wanted to thank uh, Town Clerk uh, Andy Dowd, Assistant Town Clerk uh, Karen Wilbur, and all of our election volunteers who conducted the election uh, uh, very efficiently and, uh, and uh, safely. Um, so that was a uh, uh, well-run uh, operation. Uh, and then finally, just offering my wishes for a happy and safe Thanksgiving for all of our residents. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Julianne, any reports? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I attended a meeting of the Master Plan Implementation Committee, uh, where we get monthly updates now from Weston and Sampson. And a few items of interest came up at that meeting. One, they would, we have had a survey online for many weeks um, about the downtown revitalization project. And we need to close that survey so that the consultants can start to analyze the data. So the last chance to participate in the survey will be the last day of this month. Um, I, I did go on the website today and it still says November 15th, but, but it, it should be open until um, November 30th. So that was one thing. The second thing was that they are, um, the consultants are interviewing people who have businesses in the downtown area. And uh, of course, this is a, a very good thing, but I'm also hoping that some information will come out um, that we might be able to use in dispersing ARPA funds since supporting uh, small businesses was one of the suggestions by our, um, our the participants in, in the ARPA question. And the third thing that was brought up is that um, as we look at the downtown area, as it's defined now, it of course includes Route 20, and we're going to have to do a traffic count and analysis there if there's any plans to change the traffic pattern. So there's a few details, mostly um, how to fund it, that still need to be ironed out. And um, Historic District Commission met, and they prioritized the projects that they'll be supporting for CPA, uh, um, Community Preservation Committee. And um, just happy Thanksgiving to everyone also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julianne. Uh, Scott, any reports? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, quick uh, notes uh, from the Board of Health. Uh, all the seasonal uh, clinics and COVID vaccination clinics are complete. Uh, there's over 500 flu shots administered. Um, they've also issued the Community Resources Guide um, that's available online. It was also mailed out to residents and additional copies are available at the Senior Center and Library. That Resources Guide provides uh, information uh, about uh, referrals to mental health, physical health and wellness, uh, all sorts of wonderful resources that are available to the community. Based out of the Groundwater Advisory Committee, I mentioned this last uh, meeting, uh, the Planning Board has continued to have discussions about dissolving this committee. Uh, so I notified all the affected board committee and commissions on earlier today, uh, uh, informing them of that topic and there that they may wish to put that on the agenda for their next meeting. Uh, that includes Mitch, the, the note that um, probably makes sense for us to talk about how that committee supports the select board on December 19th would be a better, uh, would be the best uh, timing for that if uh, the planning board talks about it on December 6th, which would be after our, our next meeting on December. Uh, fifth, uh, and it will be on the agenda for the next uh, Groundwater Advisory Committee. Then uh, finally, uh, John, I sent a note earlier, and I don't know if it's appropriate to 
to you know kind of ask in this form uh typically on on holiday uh times and and getting ready and and wishing everyone uh, for a good holiday uh it's sometimes we um talk about and and approve the early closing of town hall is that a topic we could take up tonight uh, for a, a noon closure on wednesday uh that would be I guess for the for the chair to determine, uh, but the board has on uh, historically uh, on occasion um, closed at noon to allow staff to get out to their families. I want I don't want to put anybody on the spot uh, tonight. Um, uh, so hey, if, if if you're okay with it, John, I'm certainly okay with it. I think it's a, that's a good idea. I'm especially. okay with it. We would you know get the notice out immediately. It, generally speaking, it is a very quiet day. Most people are focused on eating turkey and getting to family. So um, if the board wanted to do that, it'd be a, a very nice gesture to the employees. I know that'd be welcome. Scott, would you like to make a motion to that? Effect? Yeah, so uh, toward that end, uh, I move that uh, we vote to approve the early closing on Town Hall uh, Wednesday, November 23rd at noon. Just uh, for clarification, so that's yeah. the town yeah. hall, <laughs> senior center, library, DPW, yeah. but uh, does not eliminate you know, the, the central staff. So thank you, John. Is there a second to that? Second. A okay, motion's been made and seconded. Um, just thinking about library operations, I'd rather make that optional to them. I think if the library director wants to do that, that's great. Um, I don't know if that would impact any programs or anything else that that they would have. So I, given that they're a different type of operation than town hall, that's my my preference is that be be left to the jurisdiction of the uh, the library director. That makes sense, John. Uh, sure, boy, you're gonna put her in a tough spot, but yeah, <laughs> or or not. It's. <laughs> I, I, uh, generally I, I, speaking, Wednesday night is in a night, uh, but yes, I, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll, let me speak to her. Okay, I'm sure. sounds good. They're, they're currently planning to close at 3 p.m. on Wednesday, so they may have things going on. They're already planning to close early, which is great. They may have things going on between 12 and 3 if they're not. If they're not I mean, they do keep a different schedule, so your point's yeah, well taken. Yeah, yeah, that's really the idea. Uh, motion's been made and seconded with that little caveat. All those in favor? Julianne? Well, I, I was wondering if we should just postpone the vote until we, you know, get a little more clarification from the senior sent from the library. Well, do you is, want it? Would that make I sense? I think we need to let people know if we're going to do this. It's not, yeah. Yeah. This not is not much this, time. This is Wednesday um, that we're talking about. Um, this, so we don't we wouldn't be able to postpone. Um, I, I think it would be a good idea if this could be put on some regular calendar so we can you know, we can discuss okay. this early, earlier in November, yeah. over each year. So then the motion is that we close, we close town hall and the senior center at noon and the library at their discretion. Okay. Sure. And now you want to vote. <laughs> Unless there are any other comments or questions. Uh, Kristen, you've got your hand up. Uh, um, so we're not worried that the senior center might have similar sort of issues to the library, like they might have programming between 12 and 3 or something like that. Are we not concerned about that? We would, I, I, yeah, we would, we would close and the programs would be postponed if there are any programs. Yeah. Okay. Again, I wasn't really anticipating this, so uh, I apologize. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think we should plan to bring it up in the in the future early enough. I'm looking to see if the senior center has anything posted for Wednesday closures. I don't see anything. That doesn't mean that they're not. Yeah. I mean, generally we're wound up with a skeleton crew that uh, on that day, anyhow, um, because uh, you know, most, most people are traveling. So we just try to keep offices open without any major, uh, major initiatives. So yeah yeah I, I i guess i'll i'll comment further on my earlier comment that the senior center is in the same boat for a different way than the library there are also a retail operation 
um, rather than town hall, which has retail functions, but is primarily an office operation. Um, so I, it's, it, this is hard to do two days before when it hasn't been thought through. Um, I don't, I don't blame you, Scott, for this. I think it's a very, it's a, it's an appropriate initiative. Um, John, I, I really look, look to you for, for guidance as the yeah, leader. Look, so if you want to, um, if you want to I'm be gracious and let people get to their families, close at noon. Yes. I trust, you can trust me that I'll make it work with the library director and the senior center director. Okay. I don't really, see it as an really issue. Really the, the, the goal is, you know, at the discretion of yeah. not, you know, sabotaging right. uh, scheduled programming. Um, if there's an opportunity to give the staff a break, that's really the intent. Yes. And I appreciate that sentiment yeah. greatly. Yeah. Okay. All right. With, with that, let's vote. Julianne, how do you vote? Aye. Scott? Aye. Jason? Aye. Preston? Aye. I also vote aye. Vote is unanimous in favor. Thank you very much, Scott, thank for uh, for that suggestion, and, and thanks and John, did for understanding report. that. Okay, <laughs> yes. thank you. Thanks for the uh, sure. uh, including that into reports, but and that's sure. uh, nothing other else to report. Okay, uh, Julianne, I haven't. I don't think I've hit you yet for reports. Or, yes, I did. Okay, you did. All right. I'm sorry. We got distracted by having a vote in the middle of reports, which we usually don't do. So um, I think it is now my turn for reports. I'm just going to echo a couple of things that have already been mentioned that uh, the November election went very smooth. Congratulations uh, and thank you to all involved and congratulations particularly to um, Senator -elect Robin, State Senator-elect Robin Kennedy, uh, State Representative-elect Kate Donahue and Representative Meg Kilcoyne will be continuing us in a, with us in a diminished capacity of representing one precinct instead of two. And um, we look forward to having the meeting with the legislatures um, coming up, I imagine in the spring as the board usually does. Um, the community resource guide, which was already mentioned is a, is a great printed report. It's also available online. If you go to the Be Well link at the top of the town's website, you can get a PDF copy of it. And um, at least theoretically, that might be updated as additional, uh, uh, not necessarily corrections, but additions get, uh, get combined in. And I want to echo again, Christian's request that we uh, have a town meeting article to rename us to be the select board. I've begun using that in some informal communications, um, not formal yet, because we can't do that yet. And I, I hope we can we can get there and John, you and I can talk offline about what it'll take to, uh, to make that happen. Um, and if anyone needs access to the downtown revitalization survey, it is uh, pretty easy to get to on the front page of the town's website. That ends my report. And next up, we have a recommendation from the interview subcommittee. Would someone like to make a motion or discuss I would I would um I move the board vote to appoint Laura Zaiten, Janine Callahan, Mark McNinemy, and Christer, Christopher Diachetis for appointment to the temporary traffic safety committee as recommended by the interview subcommittee. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Um, just a bit of clerical information. Uh, there was an there, there are five openings on that committee. There was an additional applicant who, due to a family emergency, needed to regretfully postpone the, that interview, which I think is going to be scheduled along with some other interviews for other committees in advance of our next meeting. But acting on this would allow us to to move forward if we wanted to right away with that or delay until we have the fifth spot. Um, filled up. I understand that uh, the planning board has already selected their representative, and I'll be representing the board of selectmen um, on that temporary uh, committee. Uh, Scott, did you have your hands up? Yeah, I was going to try to get the questionnaire comment in before the motion was made. I was just going to ask for the uh, the appointments to be made as separate motions, um, but it, we already have a motion on the table and seconded. So, unless uh, Kristen wants to, to to retract, we can move forward. I think it's easier this okay. way. Then a final final comment. Um, if I wanted to be a bit of a pest, I could ask about the following logic. 
uh, this board, when given a slate of uh, an, uh, an incomplete slate of candidates, um, rejected those candidates and asked for nominations or applications to be reopened. Um, this, this set of candidates aim almost to the deadline for applications and only two people had applied as, as deadline um, uh, came. And we really only got five applicants for five positions on what was purported to be a very important committee. I don't know if there's others out there that, that want to apply. Um, I'm not gonna say, well, actually the reason I wanted to split because there's some people that I think are good candidates and others that I think we can find better candidates. And so using the same logic of the DEIB committee uh, scenario we had, I could ask for that same. Um, I don't know if any other board member feels that way, but I just wanted to point out the parallel and the um, bit about not having full slate of applicants to move committees forward. Thank you, Scott. I mean, there, there is a motion on the floor. Um, it could be potentially withdrawn or it, it could be defeated and then we could take it up some other way. Uh, Jason, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I share the concern that there were so few applicants uh, relative to the number of seats open, uh, five applicants, five seats. Um, I also observed that either in their prior communications to this board, either in public comment or email, uh, or in their application itself, uh, three of the five applicants uh, are known to me as having previously um, advocated for the creation of a traffic and safety committee. Um, and so from that standpoint, I would uh, at least prefer to see whether uh, if we extend the application period, whether some additional applicants might come forward and might provide somewhat better balance considering that part of the uh, work of this temporary committee is to determine whether we should create a permanent traffic and safety committee and uh, I would find it difficult uh, to think that uh, some of these applicants really could be fully objective uh, in making that determination, considering the past representations they've made uh, with respect to such a committee. Thank you for your comments. Um, my thought differs a little bit. I was very excited to see those the names of those who applied i think four of the five including the fifth um whose application or interview was deferred um are new to the um uh to local government in a formal sense and um i, I think one of the things that uh, i'm excited about is getting some new people involved some new people on boards that haven't been on boards before um, I think it's a it's a it's a great group. It does not concern me that they have advocated. Uh, it, you know, there are some people that have advocated for some some people out there in town have advocated against. I don't know if it's good to have a lot of people that don't really care or or don't have any idea. Um, my hope is, and my expectation is that they will all deliberate thoroughly, and ultimately that decision is up to us, not them. Uh, we will make the final decision as to whether there's a permanent. Traffic and Safety Committee, we are looking for them to come up with recommendations, not only pro or con, but also what the rules would be for that committee, how it would be run and structured. That's mostly what I'm looking for out of that board. Um, I think if we were to appoint a lot of people that didn't want to do it, why, why, you know, why would we, but we opened it up to everyone and I'm, I'm satisfied with, with that process. Kristen. I wanted to add to, um, we definitely have diversity of neighborhoods yeah. among those five people. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I, I'm glad you mentioned that was my, one of my biggest worries is we know there are a couple of areas of town that residents have advocated over and over again, whether it be for traffic and safety or just traffic and safety concerns. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, looking at the location of the residents, they're really all over the place, which is, which is great. I mean, you know, both as far as traffic and 
um, interests in, in pedestrian versus driving versus trucks versus cars, bike riding, everything else um, is, is pretty across the board. It's a pretty diverse group for, uh, for five members or, or seven if you include the board representatives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, and just a final and, word yeah. that yeah. that sure. um, you know, I'll go back to this this initial or this original idea is that there are the votes to form this committee, per, this permanent committee. So actually, you're introducing a delay of getting any of the traffic issues solved um, by more than six months. So if you know you really wanted the traffic and safety committee, just should have put it together you know, as, as a permanent committee, um, we're actually doing a disservice to the people that have urgent traffic needs to get those traffic needs discussed. And, and I haven't, I haven't mentioned this, uh, but, and, and, and I hesitate to mention it now, but what's, what's frustrating on this is that there has been soliciting of what are the traffic issues that are important to people, a list was compiled in different ways, and then no action was taken on those items. And, and this is another example of a temporary committee that's gonna deliberate for up to six months. And aside, they should be able to conduct their first meeting and make their decision. Hopefully, to, you know, just don't, don't delay on, yes, they need a permanent one, then they can spend the rest of their time on their charter. But, but what concerns me is there's a lot of talk and no action, and 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 somebody's going to say, "Well, we're taking action with this temporary committee to determine if we need a permanent committee." No, we can we can handle these, and we do handle these. A traffic question going to public safety or public works is acknowledged usually the same day, and is usually answered the next day. And I just continue to not understand how this committee accelerates the resolution of an issue, nor do I see how it's composed or would be composed of people that would understand the planning for traffic issues. So I'm very interested in solving the traffic issues. And in fact, of the 31 gathered by Kristen on Facebook, I got the first one answered and the last one answered because nobody had done anything since May. So if we want to get them done, we have the mechanisms to get questions, answers, and issues resolved. Um, if we want to form a committee to determine if we need a committee, that's lovely. But meanwhile, if somebody has a traffic or a safety issue, we have an established process that works very effectively to get the questions answered, to get the issues analyzed and assessed. And we've done mitigation when those have come before us. And that's my soapbox. We can move forward, but it's just, I, it's, it's a waste of resources. And that's what frustrates me. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate the, the thoughts. Um, you know, most of those issues were debated and decided at, at our last meeting, but um, none of the, the, the vote that we took last meeting to create this committee doesn't in any way direct staff to no longer address traffic and safety issues while these are being this these questions about what a traffic and safety committee should look like are being worked out so i trust that staff is continuing to respond and deal with the issues as they come up and uh, while the traffic and safety committee determines by its uh, lengthy research of traffic and safety committees around the state and anything else that they choose to to review to determine what recommendation to make to us. Uh, Julianne, you had your hand up earlier. Did you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just to set aside your worry, Scott, um, in interviewing the applicants, they were all well aware of the fact that they um, that their first order of business is to figure out what we have in place now and what what a traffic if and to decide how a traffic safety committee would help with with our situation in town and they were uh, they're they're well aware of their charge it's not that they're going to jump right into oh yeah we need it and um 
let's let's move on in the first meeting. Um, and you know, of the and many and to, and to your other concern about opening it up and seeing if there are more applicants, very often, and you've been on the interview committee many times, there's one applicant for one position. And, you know, that's how it is sometimes. So, but in addition, I would say that the four applicants we interviewed were, um, everyone brings something different to the table. And as Kristen pointed out, they're from different parts of town. They have um, different backgrounds. And I, I see it as a very, um, you know, a, a great committee if we approve it. So yeah. any other discussions before we vote? Okay, so again, this is on appointing four members to that committee. Um, all those in favor, how do you vote, uh, Kristen? Aye. Jason. Uh, individually, I might vote individually, different responses, but as a slate, I have to vote no. Okay. Julianne? Aye. Scott? No. I vote aye. Vote is three in favor, two opposed. The motion carries. Congratulations to our four members of that committee. And uh, I anticipate that our next meeting will have um, the fifth, assuming that the interview takes place. Um, moving along, we have a plowing and treatment agreement for private ways. John. Um, Mitch, as we make that oh. transition, could I make one more comment? Absolutely. Um, just, just looking, we do have 22 other openings for boards, committees, and commissions. So if anybody in town uh, has the uh, uh, skills and time to uh, help us out, there's, there's more than enough across all those boards, committees, and commissions to fill those slots and, and help out with town. And, and as uh, uh, I think it might've been, uh, Kristen, I think you, you said earlier in report, yeah, definitely grateful for the volunteers that step forward to do that. Yeah, as I said, Diane, let me know there are at least two additional volunteers. I have no idea who the people are or what committees they are um, that will be interviewed by the interview committee sometime in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully we'll have uh, some of those many vacancies filled. Okay, thank you. Again, uh, John, do you want to lead us in the plowing or maybe hang, hand that sure. off to Scott? It's uh, very simple. You basically set your rates at your prior meeting. You've got uh, uh, contracts for Harris Ave and Maple Lane in accordance with the fee schedule that you set. So we'll be looking for approval of those contracts. Simple enough. Is there a motion or any questions? Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to approve and execute the plowing and treatment agreements for the 2022-2023 winter season for Harris Avenue and Maple Lane. Second. Okay, motion made by Jason, seconded by Scott. Any further discussion? Let's see, all those in favor, uh, Scott, how do you vote? Aye. Jason. Aye. Julianne. Aye. Kristen. Aye. I also vote aye, vote is unanimous in favor. Um, does anyone have any other business before we open it up to our final public comments? Okay. Uh, if there are any comments from the audience, uh, before we conclude our meeting, we do have one hand up for, for Maselli, Lisa Maselli, I assume again, come on in. Hi, Lisa, what's on your mind? Hi. Well, I just wanted to recap. Um, I want to just first say thanks uh, to the interview committee for their efforts and um, and actually the whole board for addressing the traffic safety um, problems that we have as residents been going on about four years. Um, I think it's about time that we started to do something along these lines and I'm very happy that it's happening. Um, I also want to say that uh, when Scott and Jason were on the interview committees, I can't remember any discussions um, that were initiated to contrary attributes of applicants. So much so as has happened in the last few times of the new interview committee. And I think that that's, uh, that's probably in uh, bad taste. Um, this has been a, a, new, uh, a new irritant that's continued to going on that we will accept a couple of the people that are coming forward, but not all of the people and we pick and choose. And I've never seen that before. And I, and I find that a little disturbing. 
But um, I'd like to remind the board that when Jason was chairman, not only did he ignore a citizen's petition, but uh, made fun. Uh, Lisa, I, I would request that um, you not call out individuals um, as part of the comments. I, if you want to refer to a former chair or members of a former members of a committee, that's stretching it, but allowable. Um, Fair enough. Thank you. Thank so you. I'd like to know why these two selectmen are so opposed to listening to residents. Okay. And although no website was set up to hear about traffic and safety issues, very little resolve happens with that. So I think that this is something that we need to move forward with and we need to stop fighting over it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I saw a couple of hands up if either of you or anybody Mr. would Chair, like, if would you like want to address a response it. to that. I can respond to that. I will allow you. I wouldn't say that I'm asking you to, but I'm a, I will happily allow either of you to respond to that, if you will. Jason, I did see your hand up first. Uh, yeah, I, I just thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, curbing the comment. I appreciate that. Um, I think that. Uh, one thing that uh, I have tried to do is try to elicit uh, what some of the strengths or weaknesses of some of the candidates might be. Um, and it depends on the particular committee that we might be interviewing for. And so in the particular case that uh, Ms. Maselli is referring to, uh, that was an interview for the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, which has uh, voting members and alternate members. And I do make a distinction between uh, qualifications for each of those roles. And I believe that it's appropriate for a new person to first be introduced to that committee as an alternate to kind of learn the ropes and uh, determine whether or not it's a, a good fit for them, whether it's a good fit for the committee. Um, I would also say that uh, uh, I think in my um, participation in the few instances that I have as member of the interview subcommittee, try to compose a consistent set of questions that I ask of all candidates uh, and, and try to get a, a kind of a common base of responses for all of that uh, information. Um, in this particular case, for the interview for the Traffic and Safety Committee, one obvious question that might have been asked would have been whether any of the candidates had already expressed an opinion about the need for a Traffic and Safety Committee in the interest of full accountability and transparency. Uh, so unfortunately, that question wasn't adequately asked, in my opinion. And I don't think uh, we necessarily had all of the information available to us to make uh, a full assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Scott, did you have anything you would like to add? Yeah, I guess I, I guess I bristle at the question or the comment that this board or individual members board are not listening to residents. There may be an individual resident with an individual opinion that I might disagree with, but in this position as a board member, I listen to many residents and many residents have differing opinions. So if you've made a request that is not fulfilled, that doesn't mean you're not being listened to. If you've made a comment that is disagreed with, it doesn't mean you're not being listened to. We listen. We also can't take action on some of the requests that are made, or we decide not to take action on some of the requests that are made. That's not not listening to residents. That is doing the business that we need to do. So not all residents have the same opinion. Not all residents make the same requests. Not all residents make the same complaints. We take each in order and we compile amongst all the perception and perspectives and requests in town and, and do what we need to do. So uh, I don't think there's any member on this board that doesn't listen to residents. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Um, perhaps the best example of, uh, of us as a group listening to the residents is re residents have different opinion over things, as do we. Uh, as, as as exhibited by by occasional split votes, and that's okay. That's part of the process, and uh, we certainly hope all residents get along afterwards, as do we. So um, hopefully that concludes that brief sideline discussion. Uh, does anyone else have anything else before we close? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn.
So moved. Okay. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion made by Scott, seconded by Kristen to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor, uh, Jason, how do you vote? Aye. Julianne? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Scott? Aye. I also vote aye. We are adjourned at 9.24 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and